So we are going to read and annotate Act 1 of All My Sons, and we're going to break down the act into different sections. So if you scroll through this document, you will see that I have drawn a line under each section. So the first section of the play that you're going to read begins here on page one, it's down through page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, and finishes here on page seven, where this line has been drawn. So reading that section of the play should take you about eight minutes. So what I'd like you to do is pause this video now and just read those first few pages up to the line that I've just marked on page seven of this document. And as you read it, use our normal strategy of just highlighting anything that stands out to you, anything you think might be significant, important or interesting. Don't overthink it as you read, because after you've read this, you're going to unpause and I'm going to talk you through the annotations that I've made but you should pause the video now and read those first seven pages of Act One up to the line that I've marked. Having read the opening section of Act One, you will know that this play is set in the backyard of the Keller family home, and that's important. So here at the very beginning, it's the backyard of the Keller home in the outskirts of an American town. Now, a couple of things are particularly significant and important here. All this action takes place in the confined space of the backyard. And anyone who knows anything about America will know that domestically, that's quite a, um, an iconic um, setting and location, the backyard for American communities. And it's interesting that Miller sets this in an American town. It's suburban America. But the idea is here that it's somewhat universal. And really, these events could be happening anywhere. So as we read through the opening stage directions, you'll be immediately noticing some connections with Streetcar and Oleana. Both of those plays have a very confined sense of space and those in higher level will notice that Ernest is somewhat different in that as Ernest moves locations throughout the play. Um, but here we've got this confined claustrophobic space of the backyard of the Keller family home. The isolation is also created through the, pan the closely planted poplars, which are a type of tree. Um, which which sort of um, confines this family space even further and isolates them from the rest of the community. As it says here, there is a secluded atmosphere. Um, it's also important to note that it says it would have cost perhaps $15,000 in the early 20s when it was built. So this is not um, uh, a working class or um, poor area as we have in streetcar. Actually, we're in um, middle class suburbia in this play. Um, what you notice here a bit further down is in the description of the backyard, it's important to say that at the opening of the play, a four foot high stump of a slender apple tree whose upper trunks and branches lie toppled beside it, fruit still dingling in its branches. This is important because this tree, as you're going to discover later in the play, is a memorial tree planted for the son of Joe and Kate Keller, Larry, who was killed in the war um, or who has gone missing in the war. Come back to that later. Um, and at the beginning, the play opens with an image of Larry's memorial, the tree having been um, destroyed. And it is symbolically quite important because it's a, it's a mark to the audience um, that there is going to be a disruption to this um, the, the, this suburban setting in this life. And we're later then Miller introduces us to Joe Keller. Um, and it says that he is um, sitting re in the sun, reading the want ads of the Sunday paper and other sections lie neatly on the ground um, beside him. This is going to be quite important later. The fact that Joe doesn't read the news sections of the newspaper, but instead reads the want ads. So that's the wanted ads of what people are looking for here. And also on the stage at this moment is one of the neighbors, um, Dr. Jim Bayliss. And here we've got um, Joe Keller defined at the very beginning of the play as a businessman. And this is particularly important um, aspect of his identity. Similar, I suppose, to the way that John is defined through his profession as a, as a professor and Stanley as his profession as a mechanic and a very working class man. Joe Keller is defined as a businessman who's been in that sort of role for many years. Um, we've got that impression of him here.
So it moves on um, to describe and, and to add to that sense of this being a kind of um, a universal setting with actually there's some universality to the character here. So it was with a terrible concentration of the uneducated man for whom there is still wonder in many commonly known things, a man whose judgment must be dr dr dragged out of experience and a peasant-like common sense, a man among men. Joe is very much a man's man. Um, he's one of the men, um, sees himself as part of that community um, of workers, somebody who's come up through the ranks in business and has been successful. So again, um, there's another reference here as the curtain uh, opens that um, Jim is standing and staring at the broken tree. And so immediately Miller is drawing our attention to the importance of the broken tree here. Um, we then have an introduction of another neighbor and the neighbors are really important here as they're introduced at the beginning of the play. And this is Frank that's introduced here. Um, so we have a pleasant opinionated man, uncertain of himself with a tendency towards peevishness. Um, so it can be a little bit petty, Frank, um, is what peevishness means here. So the neighbors are very much introduced. And again, there's another reference down towards the bottom here about this newspaper, as Keller says, I don't read the news part anymore. It's more interest, uh, um, It's more interesting in the want ads. He's not so much interested in the news and current affairs. He's interested in what people want. And this sort of connects again to him as a businessman. If we go down onto page seven, um, again, with another reference there when Keller says, I'm, I'm just interested to see what people want. He's very much interested in the wants of other people and that's important here. Um, a little bit further down, um, you'll see the, this discussion about what people want and about also um, the wind last night that knocked down this tree. Um, and Frank notices that there's perhaps, um, he thinks it's a somewhat symbolic um, here, that the tree is, has blown down today because he says Larry was born in August. He'd been 27 this month and his tree's blown down. So it's the first sort of indication about this tree being a memorial to Larry. Um, and it is, as Frank identifies here, as symbolic actually um, and important that in the month of Larry's birthday, his tree has broken down, bro blown down. And what we find out here is that Frank is working on Larry's horoscope, says here, when I'm working on his horoscope. And Keller says, how can you do that? Um, that's for the future, isn't it? So this idea that what's the point of creating a horoscope for somebody who's dead here? Um, and Frank is uh, really holding on to the hope that Larry is alive. But what we're going to find out later is that this is very much for Kate's character um, that he's doing that. So if we move on to um, page eight in your script, um, if you have a look up there, um, it says that Frank is trying to find out um, whether November the 25th was a favourable day for Larry. So this is the day that Larry died and Kate and um, Larry's mother and Joe's wife, we're going to find out later in the play, has not really accepted that Larry has died because he's missing in action and he's been missing in action for three years and she refuses to acknowledge this. So this horoscope is sort of part of um, Frank feeding Kate's delusion that Larry might still be alive here. So a little bit further down, um, you see that Frank perhaps, um, he says here, see the point is if November 25th was his favorable day, then it's completely possible he's alive somewhere because I mean, it's possible. And what you notice here is really in the dialogue and the structure of the dialogue with the ellipses there suggests that perhaps Frank is humoring Kate and actually doesn't really believe it himself. Um, and then he says to Joe, you don't believe in anything. Um, sorry, um, to Jim, the other neighbor, you don't believe in anything. And Jim says, the trouble is you believe in anything. You didn't see my kid this morning, did you? So there's a sort of conflict in beliefs between Frank and Jim um, here at this point in the play. So moving on now to um, page nine of, the, um, of this document and in your copies of the play, um, you see that Jim um, expresses some dissatisfaction about his salary. So he says, I'd love to help humanity on a Warner Brothers salary. So it's again, this idea that money and earnings is very important in this particular community. And, and Joe Keller is somebody who has made um, a good life for himself as a businessman here, um, and that's important. And here what we get is the first mention of Annie's character. And she's often referred to in the play as Annie, but in the cast list often as Anne as well, so you can use the names interchangeably. Um, and she clearly has come back to visit. So Anne is somebody who used to live in the neighborhood, and um, as Keller says here, Joe says here, girl leaves here, a scrawny kid, 
couple of years go by, she's a regular woman. Um, so she's very much grown up and she's returned to visit the Keller family here. Um, and Jim is the character who's now living in the house that Annie and her family used to live in. So that was a very happy family used to live in your house, Jim, she says. He says here to Jim. And um, we get this sort of exchange here between um, Jim and Sue. And I think what's perhaps interesting here is this, the, the way that Arthur Miller is using the neighbours to interrupt the conversation. Um, and they very much represent the outside world here. Um, so it's, it's just interesting connection perhaps to make between Eunice and Steve in Streetcar and also perhaps between the telephone conversations that go on in Oliana. So we move down onto um, page 10 here. Um, we've got this sense um, of um, not only Frank, ar uh, sorry, Anne arriving, but also this idea that the tree has broken down. And so the play is beginning with um, what you might see as catalytic um, events. So the arrival of Anne as a character who's going to bring about some change or, um, or um, transformation to the events of this family. And also this tree having blown over is symbolic that there's, there's change happening by these um by these by these events um and so um again further kind of discu discussion here as sue says and um, tell her and come over later i imagine she'd like to see what we've done with the house so this idea that this is anne's old neighborhood and she's come back to visit um and what we find here in the beginning of the next page is that when joe is talking about um anne he says annie i don't suppose she goes around dancing on her toes but she seems to be over it um, what they're imagining that she's over is the death of Larry or the disappearance of Larry because Anne used to be engaged to Larry um, and has since moved away from the neighbourhood. So what you also notice Miller is doing during this first act of, or first section of Act One of the play is slowly feeding in bits of information about the backstory of what happened before the play began. So we're finding out about the fact that Anne has come back to visit. We're finding out about the fact that Larry has gone missing and is presumed dead um, and that Anne used to be engaged to Larry. So we're gradually finding out this information. And as Keller says here, I had two sons, now I got one. Um, so he's, his other son is Chris, who's important, who's about to enter. Um, but. Again, he always refers to them as his sons, and obviously that's significant if you think about the title um, of the play. So we're going to pause there just at the introduction of Chris's character at the end of this first section of Act One. So once again, we're going to um, divide this into sections, and what I'd like you to do now is to read from the part where we just paused at Chris's entrance in Act One. So at the top there of page um, seven, or sorry, the bottom of page seven of the PDF document, um, and you go down through page eight, page nine, page 10, page 11, page 12, page 13, and then you pause again at the top there of page 14 of the PDF document, but it's actually, as you can see, page 18 in the text at the arrival or the entrance of Kate. So you're reading between the entrance of Chris and then the entrance of Kate or mother um, at the top of um, this page of the PDF and page 18 in the document. So once again, if you're reading those pages through, that should take you again eight to 10 minutes to read those pages. And again, just do what we did before, highlight or underline anything you think might be significant, important or interesting. And then um, come back to this video when you've finished reading and we'll go through that section together. Okay, so we're starting with Chris's arrival here, um, and immediately it's important that he's defined as a man capable of immense affection and loyalty. And what you're going to see here in the play is that Chris is somebody who has affection for his mother, for his father, and also actually for Anne. Um, and that's quite important here um, with Chris's character. And what you see in the second page of this section that you've been having a look at is Chris's concern really for um for Annie and also for Kate's reaction um, to the tree having broken, having fallen down. So when he, um, they're, they're both actually, both Joe and Chris are somewhat concerned about how Kate mother is going to react to the fact that the tree is blown down here. Um, so an indication early to the audience that perhaps um, this memorial is especially important to Kate. 
Um, if you go a little bit further down here, you'll see that um, we have the entrance of this um, minor character of Bert, who is a, um, a child who lives in the neighborhood and a child that Joe kind of plays this game with here. And what, he's, what he does is he sets up um, Bert as a detective um, and they play this sort of jail game here. Um, and he makes reference, Keller, here to the fact that there's a jail in his basement, an imaginary jail, obviously, in his basement, and that he showed Bert his gun earlier in the play. Um, and they play this sort of game together, which what you'll see later is um, quite ironic, um, that Joe is playing a jail game with, with Bert. You'll see that later. Um, you also see from Bert's interaction with Joe here when he calls him Mr. Keller, that Joe is somebody who is respected in the neighborhood um, and by the community here. Um, so there's an important, that's an important um, interjection really in terms of Bert's character and his role here. Um, but shortly after that, again, we go back to this idea of the concern about Kate seeing the tree. And what we discover from Chris's um, conversation here, dialogue with Joe, is that Kate was out this morning at four in the morning. Um, she was standing right in the, in the yard um, right when the tree cracked and broke. Um, and then he says here um, that she cried hard, so hard that Chris could hear her right through the floorboards. So even before we meet Kate, mother, here in this play, we are getting a real sense that she is somebody who is suffering and mourning for the loss and death of her son, um, Larry. So she's clearly not sleeping well um, and mourning here for this. Um, and Chris thinks that here he says we made a terrible mistake with mother by being dishonest with her, um, by not making her face the truth. So Chris says, you know, Larry's not coming back and I know it. So this idea, I think, that Chris and Joe share that Kate is somewhat deluded that Larry might still be alive. So there's an obvious connection there with Blanche's character in Streetcar. But there's a much kinder approach from Chris and from Joe to Kate's delusions here, much kinder than Stanley in wanting Kate to face the truth here. Um, Chris says, but it's time she realized that nobody believes Larry's alive anymore. Um, and he does have a kindness for his mother, but there is an ulterior motive in Chris wanting Kate to face the truth here. And we find out again more details of the backstory, the fact that it's been three years um, since Larry went missing. There's no body, there's no grave um, here. Um, so it's making it difficult for Kate particularly to grieve for the death of her son. Um, and then we find out that the reason that Anne or Annie is here is because Chris says, I'm going to ask her to marry me. Um, and what you realize here is that a romance has blossomed between Chris and Annie um, following the death of um, Chris's brother, Larry, um, and that Annie and Chris are in love. Well, certainly Chris is in love with Annie at this point in the play. Um, you find out again that, um, again, re like reiterated here that Larry and Anne used to be engaged and, and Keller calls her Larry's girl, and that's quite important. But to Chris, he says she's not Larry's girl. He's seeing her very much as his girl now at this point in the play. Um, and it's important there from mother's point of view, he is not dead. Larry is not dead and you have no right to take his girl. So Joe is concerned here that when Kate finds out that Larry wants to marry Anne, it's going to force Kate to face the fact that Larry is dead at this point in the play. So we go down to the bottom um, of this page. You see here um, that you see a really kind of um, sort of heartwarming dialogue from Chris really as he talks about his love for Anne or Annie and he says these years when I think of someone for my wife I think of Annie um, and and Joe's response here if you marry that girl and you're pronouncing him dead that Chris and Anne marrying will force Kate to force to face the truth here and what you see in this exchange between Chris and um and Joe is that Joe is very much trying to keep the peace. He doesn't want to cause conflict here. It's important to note that Annie has come to visit from New York. And as we said, this the location, the setting of this play is very much a kind of generic um, suburban environment that's undefined. Um, and this idea that Kate, that Anne, Annie, sorry, comes from New York represents the world outside the suburban setting. Um, that she's bringing into this confined area. And we get this um, impression here from this exchange about business. And um, Joe is horrified, really, with the idea that Chris might give up the business for his love for Annie. Um, and 
the business is obviously very important to Joe and it's a family business and that's significant as well. Um, he says, um, because the what the hell did I work for? He says here, what the hell did I work for? That's only for you, Chris. The whole shooting match is for you. The idea that Joe has worked all his life to create this successful business to pass on to his son here. And you can see in this exchange between Chris and Joe that Joe's anger builds up in this scene up to the point where he puts a fist up to Chris's jaw. He's so angry with the idea that Joe might, that Chris might walk away from the business. Um, and then finally, the this exchange between Joe and Chris um, comes to an end really with the appearance of mother or Kate um, in the play. So we're going to pause there. So now you should be taking some time to read this section from the arrival of mother on the stage um, here. And what you're going to do is read from here um, down to, so keep going down over page 15 on this document, um, page 16, page 17, 18, and then down here to where um, Anne and Chris appear on the porch and the arrival of Anne. So you're reading up until Anne's arrival um, in this play. And please make sure, again, as you read this through, you just read it. Don't worry about annotating in lots of detail, but just highlight um, anything that you think is significant, important or interesting. And then we'll go through this section together. Again, this should take you about eight to ten minutes to read this section and then we'll go through it. So you should be now back on page 14 of this PDF or page 18 in your copy of the play. And this is the arrival or the appearance of mother or Kate on the stage um, in this opening act of the play. And it's important that she's referred to as mother in the script because she's defined by her motherhood. Um, and as Miller describes there, she's a woman of uncontrollable inspirations and an overwhelming capacity for love. And that's what really defines Kate's character, her love for Joe and her love for her children as well. So um, if we go through this section together, um, we see that um, there's a reference here to um, the domestic setting of the Keller household. And we get a sense here that they are relatively well off and comfortable. Joe says, I worked for 40 years and I got a maid. Why I have to take out the garbage? So they're, they're in a comfortable position. Money is important to Joe. It's not necessarily about status here. Um, it's about making sure that his family are comfortable here. It means his family can be well looked after. He says, I got money again. I would have a maid and, a, and my wife would take it easy. Now I got money and I got a maid and my wife is working for the maid. So again, this sort of lighthearted, um, almost banter conversation between Keller, Chris and um, the mother here. But what Miller is showing us is that this family are relatively well off and comfortable and that's important to Joe. Um, so Kate um, or mother is looking around here um, and looking at the tree and her response to the tree having blown down is so much for that, thank God. It's important because Kate is actually happy that the tree's blown over. She doesn't want to accept that Larry's dead. So a memorial to Larry um, goes against her, her beliefs and her values here. Um, and what we get a bit further down is she says, um, this month is his birthday and his tree blows down and Annie comes. And again, it's this sense that these events are colliding together, that something is going to happen here to disrupt this family unit um, and the peace that they share. Um, Chris is revealing here his um, attraction towards Annie as she says, uh, he says, Does, isn't she looking well? And what you notice, it's really important to look at the stage directions of mother's behavior here. She just looks at him nodding ever so slightly, almost as though admitting something. So there are various hints and suggestions with mother's character throughout act one that she knows more than she's willing to either admit or to express here. And a sense that perhaps she actually is aware that Chris and Annie have formed a relationship, but she's not willing to accept that because as she says here, she's one that didn't jump into bed with somebody else as soon as it happened with her fella. So she respects that Annie has not remarried and found another man. And of course that helps to solidify her delusions that Larry might still be alive. Um, and then again, you've got an example of Chris coming into conflict with his mother here by saying it doesn't mean she's been mourning Larry. So Chris is suggesting that Kate has actually moved on here. Um, and then um, we have on this page. Um, so we're on page 20 of your copies of the script of page 16 here. 
this very poignant and quite sad dis- description of Kate's mental state and the mourning that she she's experiencing and the trouble her troubled um, mental health really when we think about how she's um, struggling with the death of Larry and that's obviously conveyed here through the monologue that's expressed here in this section of um, of this page and you see I mean immediately if you look at it you can see connections with Blanche's monologues you know unfinished sentences exclamations. Um, pauses and ellipses, breaking off, um, you know, imagining Larry. And what she does is she has this dream here that she imagines that um, he was so real I could reach out and touch him. And then suddenly he starts to fall and crying and crying to me, mum, mum. And this idea that she imagines him crying out for his mother, for her at the moment of his death. And it's a real sense of her, um, her, her anxiety over his suffering here. Um, and then her absolute refusal to accept that he may actually be dead. We should never have planted that tree. I said it in the first place. It was too soon to plant a tree for him. She's not willing to accept yet that he is dead. Um, And again, it's asserted here when she repeats, I said not to plant it yet. And what Chris does here um, is tries to make her face reality at this point. And obviously he's got an ulterior motive here because he wants her to accept Larry's dead so that um, he can move on and marry Annie. Um, And he says here, maybe we ought to put our minds to forgetting it. And I think there's a real, there's a contrast between the way Chris tries to make make Kate face reality versus the way that Stanley makes Blanche face reality because he's much kinder and more gentle here. And yes, he does have an ulterior motive, but he also has just heard his mother express um, that suffering from the previous monologue. And he wants her to move on really at this point. Um, And as Chris says, we never took up our lives again. It's as if the family have not moved on either because of it. And there's a suggestion here that they they go out and they have some fun, um, really, to try to move on. Um, and again, um, further on down here, um, it says there's some suspicion about why Annie's particularly come to visit now. Um, and Keller says, um, what do you mean? Um, he lived next door to the girl all his life. Why shouldn't he want to come and see her again? Um, a mother looks at him critically. So this, these stage directions suggest that um, perhaps there is this sense that Kate does actually know what's going on between Chris and Annie, but she's unwilling to accept it. Um, and then she does say he's not, he's not going to marry her. So she makes this declaration or this warning here um, in this statement. And there's an ongoing theme in this play about the idea that people know what's going on, but they refuse to accept it or face it. Um, and again, um, mother Kate asserts here she's not his girl Joe. She's uh, she knows she's not. This idea that Anne Anne is um, Larry's girl is quite important here. She's as faithful as a rock um, is the imagery that um, Miller uses here to describe um, Kate's interpretation of Annie's loyalty to Larry. Um, and she wants I want and she says to Keller I want you to act like he's coming back both of you. She wants, she wants Joe and Chris to join her in believing that Larry's alive here. Um, and she says, believe with me, Joe, I can't stand all alone. And this idea that she's looking for somebody to share her belief um, there. If you look at the next page, the top of page 23 in your edition of the play or page, um, what page are we on here? Um, page 19 of this document. Um, again, this sort of desperation, you above all have got to believe. And she says to Joe, it's really important that particularly he believes that Larry's still alive. Um, and there's a perhaps a, a, a suggestion here about why it might be particularly important that Joe believes that Larry's alive. Um, and now obviously that could be because he's his father, but as we're going to discover later in the play, there is more reason for, for Kate or mother to want um, Joe to believe and for Larry to be alive here and particularly around Joe's responsibility here. And he says, what do you what do you mean me above all? So again, these sort of indications that there might be more to this than what's being suggested here in this opening. And again, we get this um, interjection at this point with Bert, the neighborhood child. And again, this reference to the jail game that they're playing. And Kate um, is in the stage directions furious here um, at the game that they're playing together. Um, and she says, I want you to stop Joe. Uh, I want you to stop that Joe, this that whole jail business. Um, this idea that it's it's perhaps hitting a little bit close to home for Kate and she doesn't approve of him making a joke over it. And what you've got here is really an act of foreshadowing on the part of Miller 
about Joe's guilt here. And when Joe says, what have I got to hide? What the hell's the matter with you, Kate? This idea that he's being perhaps somewhat defensive. And then this section of the play ends with um, the arrival or the entrance of Anne um, at this particular point. So you pause the video at this point, and then what you need to do is read from Anne's arrival here um, on the top, on the end of page 23 in your script or page 19 in this PDF. And then you're going down over page 20 of the PDF, 21, 22, 23, uh, 24, and stopping there um, at the moment where um, Anne says that he stand, she stands there in silence and turns trembling going up stage and says no to Kate at that point. So if you can just read from um, Anne's arrival up until that particular mo moment in the script, Again, just read, annotate, highlight anything you think might be significant, important or interesting. And then we will go over that section together. And reading that should take you about 10 minutes. So as soon as Anne arrives on the stage, there's an indication of romance between her and Chris as Chris offers her his arm here um, and an indication of a romantic relationship between the two of them, further emphasized by his reference here to her being the prettiest gal you ever saw. Um, and again, um, mother or Kate doesn't respond very well to this and she's critical of Anne here responding to Chris's interests or reacting to Chris's interests here. Um, we then have this introduction between Jim and Anne and remember that um, earlier in this scene it said that Jim and Sue have moved into the house that Anne used to live in in this area so that's important Anne has come back here. So an indication here when um, Anne says I guess I never grew up and um, it's it almost seems that mum and pop are, are, in, are still in there now. Um, so they're obviously not there. And there's, there is an also a sense with Anne that she's also somewhat stuck in the past here um, in terms of being um, troubled by what's happened um, in the backstory of the play. Another sort of interjection here between Jim and Sue, which is an interesting representation of marriage. It can make some interesting connections between Eunice and Steve's marriage and streetcar and possibly between even John and his wife's marriage was represented through the telephone calls in Oliana. Um, and then towards the, uh, towards the bottom of this page, um, so we're on page 21 of the PDF, mother says, you think of him, you see, she thinks of him and she's absolutely delighted that she thinks that Anne is still in love with Larry and still thinks of Larry um, here. But Anne's response to this is actually quite interesting because um, she's surprised that Kate has been preserving Larry's room. She's staying in Larry's room and it's Larry's clothes that are in there and his shoes are all shined up. Um, so although Annie is perhaps a little bit stuck in the past in some way, she has actually moved on from her relationship with Larry um, and is surprised that Kate is still maintaining the illusion that Larry may still be alive. Down towards the end of this page, you get some more information about Anne's backstory. Um, as mother says um, to Anne, your mother, she's not getting a divorce then. No, she, and Anne says, no, she's calmed down about it. And mother says, because your father is still, I mean, he's a decent man after all said and done. So there's clearly been some problems in Anne's parents' marriage that Joe and Kate are familiar with here, possibly the reason why they left the area. Um, but again, Miller is slowly drip feeding in the backstory of the play here. Um, and she's quite confident in the way that she asserts to um, Kate that she's not waiting for Larry, she, that she has moved on, which says, well, I'm not Kate. And um, Kate refuses really to accept this and her frustration grows over the course of this dialogue, right down to when she becomes incre it, she, with increasing demand, she says to Anne, but deep down in your heart, Annie, you must, you know, this idea that she deep down, she must believe that um, Larry is still alive. The, fr the frustration is increasing over the course of this dialogue. And she says here, um, they don't say it on the radio, but I'm sure that in the dark of night, they're still waiting for their sons. Um, you know, this idea that Larry is symbolic of all the sons that are missing or dead in the war here. Um, and that Kate is certain that mothers are still holding on to that hope that those, um, those boys are still alive. And she says here, don't let them think, uh, don't let them tell you what to think, listen to your heart and only your heart. It's as if she's almost begging Anne to wait for Larry and to join her in the delusions here. 
Um, and she says, you know, Anne is questioning, why does Kate have to um, be so desperate? Why does she have to hold on to this delusion? And Kate's significant here that Kate says, because certain things have to be like the sun has to rise. That's why there's God. Otherwise, anything could happen. So it's this idea that her holding on to this delusion is precariously holding um, this family together, perhaps, and that something bad will happen if she accepts the fact that Joe is dead. Uh, sorry, that Larry is dead, um, that that something else will happen. So it's she says certain things have to be, and we're not sure um, what things have to be um, alongside this. And there's this sort of um, conflict between the two women here as, as mother asserts at the end of this, um, Anne, you know I'm right. And Anne responds, no, Kate. Absolute confidence and a, uh, confidence and a sort of silent a moment of silence here as the two women confront each other with their opposing beliefs. So after this section, you're going to need to read the next section of Act One, starting with um, Mother saying, I have some tea and Frank's appearance here um, on page 24 of the document. Um, working through this um, section through page 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, and to the middle of page 35 um, of this document, which is actually page 39 of your document. It's a longer section of the play, so I would imagine this will take you around 15 minutes to read it. And remember, you are reading and just highlighting anything you think is significant, important or interesting. And we'll go back over that section together when you've read that. So um, moving on to this next section, um, beginning on page 24 on this document or page 28 in your copy of the text. Um, what I think is important here um, is at the end of this page, you get this discussion again about Anne's father. Um, and the way that Frank speaks about her is described in the stage directions here. Um, and we discover here when he mentions parole that um, Anne's father is in prison. Um, and what's important here is the way that Frank talks about um, public opinion. And he says, um, an in, if an intelligent man like your father is put in prison, there ought to be a law that says either you execute him or let him go after a year. And obviously, this kind of court of public opinion is very damning towards Anne's father um, at this particular point. And we find out here Anne's anxiety that people are still gossiping and talking about her dad. Um, and this idea that, that the neighborhood have not forgotten um, really what's happened here. Um, and again, this is another reference that Kate makes here to the idea of um, Joe playing policeman with the kids and this jail game. Um, and there's, there's some irony to that when we find out later what's been actually happening here. So if you go down onto the next page again, um, this last statement by Anne here when she says murderers, remember that Kate, um, Mrs. Hammond standing in front of our house and yelling that word, she's still around. So whatever it was that Steve did, um, Steve is Anne's father, is something that really turned the whole neighborhood against them um, as a family and is clearly something um, that brought great shame on Anne and her family here. Um, and then mother um, says here, um, they still remember about dad, it's different with him. Um, he was exonerated. So obviously here it's clear that Joe was actually involved in the um, situation that ended up with um, Anne's father being put into prison. And what we get here on this page is this backstory revealed here that um, what happened was, um, as you see down here, um, I was the beast, the guy who sold cracked cylinder heads to the Army Air Force, the guy who made 21 P-40s crash in Australia. So um, Joe's company, um, and of course it was uh, in this, it's um, Steve, who was uh, Anne's father, who worked in the company, who went to prison for this crime um, here. And he's saying, um, and he's saying, um, except I wasn't the person that did there. And there's a court paper in my pocket to prove that I wasn't. So this idea that um, Joe has this piece of paper that symbolizes or represents his innocence is important here. And he says up here um, that 
when he was exonerated, he got so I got out of the car to walk down the street, but very slow and with a smile. And um, I was so he sort of faced everybody, faced public opinion here. Um, and then at the end, he said, "I had one of the best shops in the state again, a respected man again, bigger than ever." So in the end, Joe's business has got even better in the end um, here because he's managed to brave the um, uh, the crime that his partner committed here. Um, in creating or selling these cracked cylinder heads to the army. Um, and what you can see in Joe's reaction here is his admiration for his father. You know, as we said earlier, um, Chris is somebody who really admires his father and has great love for his father. Um, and, um, you know, he says, um, Joe says to Anne, the worst thing you did was to move away from here. Um, this idea that she should have braved it out, she should have um, stayed here. Um, is what Joe thinks. Um, what's interesting here is that when he talks about the crime that Anne's father, Steve, committed, he said he can't be a murderer. Um, and Joe very much sees this as an error and a mistake and, a, a, and a, um, an accident almost that Steve created these cracked cylinder heads and sold them to the army. Um, and he's making a very clear distinction to say that he doesn't consider this murder. Um, and that's very important when we think about what happens later in the play. Um, and then further down here says, uh, reveals that she is a little ashamed but determined in the fact that she's never written to her father. So, you know, since he's been sent to jail, she has rejected her father. And when you think about that in contrast with Chris's admiration and love for his father, um, that's very important here. And Chris, almost, so he says he agrees with what Anne, Anne has done here. He murdered 21 pilots, um, he says here. And um, Anne makes the connection between the death of the 21 pilots and the death of Larry. Um, and he says here, um, he knowingly shipped out those parts that would crash an aeroplane. Um, and how do you know Larry wasn't one of them? Um, now, Mother responds down here that as long as you're here, Annie, I want you to never ask, never to say that again. And it's the sort of indication here, again, that Mother might know somewhat more than she's letting on here um, and is absolutely horrified by the idea that Anne is equating the deaths of the pilots in Australia with the death of Larry um, and seeing a connection between the two um, that um, Mother or Kate is absolutely adamant not to acknowledge. Um, further on down here, it says... Um, Sorry, it's my phone. Um, it says further on down here. Um, Joe is very keen to um, distinguish between the pilots that were killed or in um, through his company's error or through Anne's father's error here and Larry. And very keen to say, what's the matter with you? You know, Larry never flew a P-40. Um, and he says, you know, it's absolutely adamant that... Um, Steve, Anne's father, is a fool, but not a murderer. And that, that's very important that he keeps repeating this um, over and over. He sees it as a mistake. And you've got this very long monologue here um, where he talks about um, the crime that was committed and the way that the um, community reacted to this. And this long monologue that um, Joe has explaining the actions here and explaining what uh, what happened is quite important. Um, and again, he says here, that's a mistake, but it ain't murder. Um, that's quite important that he makes that distinction. Um, and Joe, Joe there is, is it, as it says he, um, earlier, he's angry by the end of this. And over the course of this um, dialogue between Joe and Chris and Anne, Keller gets, or Joe gets increasingly angry. And you can see from the buildup in the monologue there, down here to the stage directions where um, he's angry really because of the way that Anne is treating her father, um, which is an interesting point that he's, he's angry about the fact that Anne is rejecting her father because of this. Um, down here, you have this idea um, that um, Chris is, is talking about, he says, isn't he a great guy? Um, and Anne says, you're the only one I know who loves his parents. You know, again, emphasizing the contrast between Anne's relationship with her parents and Chris's relationship with his, that he really does love um, Joe and he really does love Kate. He's got a great affection for his parents and a very positive rela um, uh, relationship with them. And then the stage clears really at the end of this scene here um, where um, 
Joe and uh, Kate's already left the stage, but he exits here, leaving Chris and Anne alone on the stage. And you have this quite sweet and romantic exchange between Anne and Chris, where Chris declares that he loves Anne here. And Anne says that, Chris, I've been ready for a long, long time. Um, you know, again, reinforcing the idea that she's moved on from her relationship with Larry. She's come to terms with the fact that she thinks Larry is dead. Um, and you've got this real sense of um, sort of nervous excitement here from Chris as he um, kisses Annie um, here. And it's a very um, sweet, romantic moment where we see these two um, embarking on this romantic relationship together um, here. Um, but what you discover if you look towards the end of um, page 35 in your document and page 31 in this PDF is at the end of this, Chris starts to talk about his experience of war. Um, and the fact that he was in command of a company and he lost um, a lot of men here, if not just about all of them, he says. And so what you get here with Chris is another example of a character who is still feeling the impact of war. And he's carrying the guilt here. He says, and um, they didn't die, they killed themselves for each other. And um, this idea that um, there are complex moral decisions to be made in war and people sacrifice um, their lives and we really see that through again through a, a monologue and um, structure how much chris is struggling with the guilt of this when he says i felt wrong to be alive to open a bank book to drive a new car and to see in the new refrigerator and then you know it's perhaps not a leap to suggest that he's having some guilt over the fact that he's alive and moving on with his life and forming a romantic connection with um larry's girl um annie here and moving on um and and reassures him that there's nothing wrong with your money. Your father put hundreds of planes in the air. You should be proud. You know, again, this idea that's been reinforced earlier in this act that Joe's business is all about providing for his family. And um, it's something that Anne and Chris both feel they should be proud of. Um, and again, we see Joe's values here when Chris says, I'm going to make a fortune for you. You know, this idea that their, their want to succeed here is very much about providing for their family. Um, and that's really important here, Joe's values. Um, and we get this kind of quite nice um, interchange here when Joe comes out and sees them. Um, and then um, the scene is then interrupted by a phone call from George. And George is Anne's brother, and he's phoning long distance, which probably means across the country here. Um, and again, what you can make is an interesting connection with the use of the telephone as a dramatic device to interrupt the action in Streetcar and Doliana um, in comparison here. And Anne goes off stage to take this call from her brother. And during that time, Chris tells Joe that he and Annie are getting married here. Um, and it's interesting here that Joe is not necessarily quite so engaged in Chris's news. He's actually quite distracted by George's phone call, as shown through his um, disrupted dialogue here, um, interrupted thoughts here, the stage directions describing him as being uncomfortable. Um, and he says, all these years, George didn't go to see his father and suddenly he goes to see him. Um, it, it's clear here that Joe is nervous. He's wondering why George has visited his father at this particular moment. Um, Keller also, or Miller also reveals to the audience another aspect of the backstory, which is to his last day, that's Steve Ann's father's last day in court, the man blamed it all on me. So there was ongoing accusations that actually it was Joe Keller's fault and not Steve's fault about this. And Joe seems very nervous about the idea that they might open up the case um, and create some hurt um, for him here. Um, so, and then later on down here, we see um, he says that he wants a clean start for Chris, a new sign over the plant. He wants to give the family business to Chris. And this idea that um, he, I want um, you to use what I made for you. It's, a, it's an idea that um, everything that he's done is for Chris in terms of his business success here. Um, and Joe wants Chris to enjoy the money here. Don't be ashamed of the money um, because money's good. There's nothing wrong with money. Um, and there's a really clear sense of affection between um, Chris and Joe here, um, as it says here, with overriding affection and self-confidence now. Um, there's laughter between them. It's a close moment between father and son as he talks about passing on his business to his son, which is an important value for him. So we're going to pause there um, at the end of um, this section as Anne comes back out here after speaking on the telephone to George, where she says, all right, um, all right, goodbye. She hangs up the receiver and then comes out of the kitchen and back into the back porch. So if you just pause there, 
And so we've pretty much made it to the end of Act One. Um, and this next section is only really um, a couple of pages just to finish off the end of Act One. So if you just take a minute or two to read just from the underlined bit there to the end of Act One, um, then I think I might have said Act Two a minute ago, but just read to the end of Act One. And again, read, highlight, annotate anything you think is significant, important or interesting, and we'll go back over it together. So just read it, pause this video, and then restart when you've finished reading it. So we can see Miller using a similar dramatic device here when Keller um, confirms that George is coming to visit and he's coming here on the seven o'clock. He's in Columbus um, and he's coming here to this location. So the entrance of George and obviously the mystery created at the end of act one is, is something of a cliffhanger to think, what is George going to bring here? And why is George coming to visit? We've had the tree at the beginning signifying, you know, some uprooting and some disruption here. Um, we've had the arrival of Anne um, at this moment and now followed by the arrival of George um, and his brother. And again, um, as, as they talk here, and there's clearly some anxiety from Joe about the arrival of George, um, Anne says here, um, when, she, when she and Chris exit to go for a drive, mother comes down towards Keller, her eyes fixed on him. And there's a real sense here again in the stage directions that Kate or mother knows more than she is um, expressing or confessing here at this particular moment. And she reminds Joe significantly that George is now a lawyer. Um, and it's, there's a warning here in her voice here as she speaks to Joe. Um, and again, Joe feigns indifference to this, suggests that he's not worried, but there's clearly a sense of anxiety from um, Kate's perspective when she says, why Joe? Um, what, uh, what has Steve suddenly got to tell him that makes him take an airplane to see him? So, you know, suddenly after all this time, Joe, uh, sorry, George has gone to visit his father um, and they're suspicious about why that might be. And in the stage directions, you can see um, Joe being um, frightened, as it says here. Um, he's hope he's got hopeless fury there as he exits the stage at the end. And Kate reminds him, be smart now, Joe. This boy is coming, be smart. Um, and again, further indications that she knows more than she's letting on um, at the end of Act One. And much like really the end of Streetcar and in Oliana, the, the, the divisions of the acts in the play signify um, a, a sort of a climactic moment here at the end of the act, but also something of a cliffhanger as we wait to see what the arrival of George will bring at the beginning of Act Two.